Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. At Quartz Hill in Los Angeles County, a woman that works for me states that her husband spotted a Bigfoot-type creature approximately one mile west of Lancaster, California. Being born in Lancaster, I've heard often of the stories of sightings. I was an unbeliever until I had my own encounter in the Kennedy Meadows area of the Golden Trout Wilderness area. This woman and her husband are very credible. The being approached her property and looked over her fence surrounding her backyard. The alert of their dogs yielded the need to investigate. When her husband walked out and approached the area, he spotted the being. The being ran one way and the husband ran back to his house. On to the next one. In Kern County, California, my girlfriend, who later became my wife and I, were traveling on a rural road, Cottonwood Road, that connects the outskirts of Bakersfield, California, to Lamont, California, a small town 14 miles outside of Bakersfield. This area is surrounded by agricultural fields, mostly grape vineyards. I was traveling at approximately 55 miles per hour, that was pushing it for my 65 Mustang at the time. As we talked, we both saw something walking very fast, almost a slow jog across the road southbound. I slowed down without slamming on the brakes so as to not lose control and try to figure out what we were seeing. We saw its right side and its back as it ran into the field. The head to the shoulder was slouched. I could not see a neck. It was approximately six feet tall with long arms and thick legs. It never looked at us as it crossed. It was extremely dark, almost shadowy, but very much real. It appeared to be very hairy. As we passed it, it never looked back. I quickly stopped and began a U-turn, at which time my girlfriend yelled at me, asking what the heck I was doing. She knew what I was about to do. I drove back to the location where it ran into the field and hit my brights, but did not see anything. My girlfriend was yelling at me to get going, so I did. I returned to that area the following day, but it had rained and I could not locate any footprints as it was too muddy. My wife will only discuss it if I bring it up. Aside from that, she never talks about it. To this day, I have no idea what we saw. I know that it was not a human, as we know it. Yet, I cannot say that it was a complete animal either. I still drive by there once in a while and wonder what it was that we saw that night. The area is agricultural fields, corn, vineyards, and the like. Greenfield Junior Baseball Diamonds were just to the west of the sighting. On to the next one. At a youth camp in Sonoma County in California, there were 20 kids, all about 16 to 18 years in age. There were two dorms. One dorm was going out to the east and the other dorm was going down to the south with a living area and a kitchen in the middle. Each dorm was open to the middle. There were two large windows at the end of the dorm with a door in the middle. I was in the dorm to the south sitting on my bed. There were three kids still up in my dorm. It was about 9.30 or so at night. We were getting ready for bed. About 10 of us were still up. I heard the kids in the east dorm start to yell and say someone is walking around outside. I heard the counselor say that there was no one outside and go to bed. So I didn't think too much of it. A few minutes later, they started to yell again. The counselors got mad at the kids for yelling and turned out their dorm lights. I thought they were just goofing off because we were a good 10 miles from town and no one would just be out there walking around. 
About two or three minutes went by when a movement caught my eye out the window. I was about 12 feet from the window. I looked out the far window from my bed and I saw what looked like someone at the garbage dumpster. There was a big light, but it was hard to see. I kept looking, but didn't say anything. I didn't want to get in trouble if it was nothing. It started to walk to the end of the dorm and I lost sight of it because of the door in the middle. I was trying to look around the door from my bed when it looked in the window from the other side of the door. It was bent down looking in the window and I was looking out the window. I was 12 feet away. We looked at each other for about 20 to 30 seconds, which seemed like a long time. I could see it was holding stuff in its left arm and it had brown eyes and kind of a big nose. Well, I got scared and dove under my blankets and when I came back up, it was gone. I think seven to 10 kids saw it, but maybe not as good as me. I'm not sure. No one said much about it. It didn't try to hurt anyone or seem threatening when I got scared, but I was a kid of 16. The next day, a large box with tuna cans in it was sitting on the ground by the garbage. I had put it in the garbage the night before. There were some large footprints all around. I don't know how big, we didn't have a tape measure. It was mostly redwood forest with some large rivers. The Russian river was nearby. On to the next one. In Inyo County in California, when I was a young boy, my father would take me backpacking into the Sierra Nevada mountains every summer. When I was 10 years old, my father decided I was strong enough for a long excursion in the wilderness, and we set off for a place called Seven Lakes near Big Pine. We had hiked for a few days when we came to the sixth lake, and we could see the seventh lake just beyond it. Seventh Lake was covered with ice, and there was snow all around just past where we decided to camp for the night. We thought this would be a good place to stay and explore the next day. During the night, a snowstorm hit and it became freezing cold. So my father and I put our sleeping bags over us and huddled together for warmth. I kept looking at my father's watch and hitting the light on it to see when we could expect the sun to rise so we could get warm. It was 3.45 a.m. when we heard footsteps walking up the trail toward us. Our tent was right on the edge of the trail and whatever was out there was walking on two feet and was very big. We could almost feel the ground shake as it got closer. My father and I looked at each other in silence. Both of us were a bit shocked by what we were hearing. It walked right up to our tent and stood there for about five minutes, completely silent. I have very good senses and I could feel that whatever it was, it absolutely didn't want us there. I could feel its anger resonating. I can't explain how long, but I got the most scary feeling in my heart. It wanted us to leave. Then it walked off just as suddenly as it came, but it headed in the direction of the frozen lake and beyond the trail went into a very rugged wilderness. I didn't think it was a person because it had no flashlight. It was very large and only an idiot would continue walking on the trail into the wilderness at that time of night in the middle of a snowstorm. My father and I were quite frightened by our nighttime visitor and when first light hit, we instantly broke camp and headed down the mountain without making breakfast nor saying a word to each other. We both knew we had to get out of there. Unfortunately, we were so far in the wilderness that we had to camp again that night further down the mountain. But this time we were not visited, luckily. My father has an MBA and is a successful businessman, very well liked and trusted in his community. To this day, we still talk about the incident from time to time and we still don't know what it was. At the time the incident happened, I was so scared I didn't even think to look for tracks, and I don't think I wanted to. We didn't notice the smell, but the direction of the wind was going from us toward the creature, and I think that may be why we didn't smell it. We never actually saw it, but it sure didn't seem to be a man. 
nothing noteworthy other than the vibe the creature was giving. It was like nothing I've ever felt before. My father served in Vietnam and it spooked him pretty good. It was around 3.45 a.m. Windy, moderate snow, cold, probably about 30 degrees. We were in a huge glacial valley with lots of trees and large rocks. Beautiful, but very isolated and rugged wilderness. On to the next one. Dave William and Ben Lawson were at a campsite when they noticed a garbage smell and heard heavy footsteps and loud breathing. They then saw a 12-foot tall creature in their car headlights. The next day, footprints were found. This was in Scott Valley in Santa Cruz County in California. On to the next one. Carissa and I had been together for over two years. Things were great, and I wanted to propose before some other doofus came along and swept her off her feet. Kidding. I wanted to take us somewhere special for a long weekend getaway that would be a suitable place for me to do the deed. Since we both lived in Wisconsin, I wanted to take us somewhere reasonably close in case harsh weather might interfere with my plans. I found a romantic spot in Door County, a top-rated tourist destination. I rented us a beautiful cabin that overlooked a frozen lake. Even closer to that lake, was a gazebo with a hot tub in its center. Coincidentally, the Sasquatch came into view just before I was able to pop the question. It came bursting out of the woods that enclosed the gazebo and was even closer than us to the lakeshore. It was running on three limbs because it was using the fourth to carry what looked to be a heavily mangled deer carcass. The animal was the most muscular thing I've ever seen, resembling the Incredible Hulk, but covered in very dark brown hair. Perhaps the most surprising thing of all was how it appeared to be fleeing from something. I must have seen it glance over its shoulder three or four times before it made it across the lawn to the other side of the forest. Neither Carissa nor I heard any gunshots, so that leads me to believe that another one of its kind had spooked it. Maybe it thought something was trying to take its hard-earned prey. In any case, it's tough to fathom that thing feeling threatened by anything at all. Silently, we waited in the hot tub for somewhere around 10 minutes afterward. Fortunately, nothing came chasing after the Sasquatch at least, nothing visible to our senses. The entire sighting probably only happened for a maximum of five seconds, but it made my muscles feel inadequate. There's no chance in heck that my testosterone levels could compete with whatever that thing had gone going on inside its body. Physically, it was superior in every way imaginable. I never would have imagined that something so bulky could move with such grace. It was like it was one with the earth. If these things could be one of the missing links between human and ape, that would mean they've been around for a very long time. If that is the case, I suppose they would have adapted to the wild ways we humans can't comprehend. I mean, if you're living off deer and other meaty herbivores, evolution would need to accelerate your speed, strength, and slyness. It's no wonder that most people probably don't spot these things even when they're extremely close. I don't know if the one we saw merely felt like being reckless, but it didn't seem to care at all. It was right there for us to see. I don't think there's any chance it could have known we were there. As I remember, we were both being very loud, following a few cocktails, and no, the alcohol didn't trigger any hallucinations. I wish there was snow at the time of the encounter so that I could have gotten some photos of the tracks. I'd been so shocked throughout that night that I had completely forgotten to follow through with the proposal. Carissa was in a similar state, which seemed to prevent her from hinting at finishing the deed. Her agreement to marry me had a way of boosting my confidence, and I think it helped me feel courageous enough to step outside to check the soil for tracks. Maybe I didn't look thoroughly enough, but nothing caught my eye. Although we were terrified during the end of our vacation, something about the sighting 
made things even more romantic and memorable than they would have been otherwise. Carissa and I are still married, and we've referred to the event on many occasions, expressing how we got to experience something so out of the ordinary while together. On to the next one. My husband John passed away in 2009 from what is known as a AAA, which in medical terms is an abnormal aortic aneurysm. He came home from work one night complaining of a stomachache from the food he ate, fell asleep, and never woke up. He was a huge Bigfoot fan, as am I, and he always spoke of what I'm about to share with you. It is really in memory of him that I share what we saw. In 2002, we were living near Wolf City in Texas. My husband and I were both avid naturalists, and it was in the pursuit of all things natural that we spent most of our free time together. North of where we lived was the Caddo National Grassland, in the middle of which was a body of water named Coffee Mill Lake. We enjoyed hiking around different parts of the lake, seeking out waterfowl to photograph, and had been there many, many times before this event occurred. That same year, the two of us had made our way over to what I will call the middle northern part of Coffee Mill Lake. There is a peninsula of land there that has the lake's water running along both sides, forming two separate marsh-type areas on either side of it. It was in this area where we had taken some nice shots of swans and other birds on past hikes. On this day, we had hiked in with our hopes, as always, being there would be some nice birds in that area to photograph. We made our way down the north side of the lake where we were standing at what I will call the back end of this marshy area. And we noticed two adult swans with some babies coming down the shore in our direction. Now, they don't call this the grassland for nothing. There is very tall, wheat-colored grass everywhere, with a lot of taller trees interspersed with the grass throughout. As we stood our ground and waited for the swans to get to where we were, David extended his finger toward the shoreline from which the swans were only feet away and said to me, Honey, what's that moving over there? When I looked, I saw nothing, and David followed by saying, It just ducked down. Keep watching. Moments later, something large and darkly colored appeared to arch what I thought was its back, just high enough that I could see it in the tall grass and then it was gone again. We thought we may be seeing a bear or something, and I remember grabbing David's arm out of fear. Whatever this thing was, it was hiding in the tall grass only a couple of feet from the water's edge, and these swans were getting close to passing right by it. Within our field of view, we were both looking directly at the swans, and the location of whatever this was at the same time, without having to shift our eyes. Just as I was thinking that the swans were right in front of whatever this was, a large brown limb, which I know now was an arm, extended from and retracted back into the grass, having taken an adult swan with it. It happened as fast as a prize fighter throws a jab. It was simply boom, boom, and it was over. There was no noise from the swan, nothing. Even the other swans didn't seem to realize what had happened. That's how quick it was. We watched as the grass started to move where the arm had come from, when, before our very eyes, a large Bigfoot stood to its feet with the swan in its hand. It turned to look directly at us and walked away into the trees, frankly. We couldn't believe what we had just seen. The Bigfoot obviously had no idea we were there, and if it did, it had walked right into the grass only 200 feet away from us, and we hadn't seen it. We were both wearing bright and colorful clothes 
with no effort on our part being put into concealing ourselves from it or anything else for that matter. When it looked our way, it was already in stride and having seen us, turned its head in a matter-of-fact way and kept walking. Having seen this attack and how quickly and simply it had occurred, the two of us were now wondering just how many times this may occur in this area. Of course, all the stars had to be aligned with where it was in relation to the bird, but it seemed so well rehearsed that surely it had done this before. As far as the creature's height was concerned, our guess was that it was about seven feet tall, and it was extremely thick from side view. Its coat was a darker shade of brown with some sandy or white kind of highlights as well, and it left us feeling as though it wanted nothing to do with us, having walked away. After about a half an hour had passed, we walked over to where it had been in the weed, where the grass from where it began in the wood line was completely matted down like an alligator had just crawled through it. From that, we knew the Bigfoot had crawled up to the water's edge on its belly. Of that, there was no doubt. On to the next one. Early in 2014, I began making my own plans to hike the Pacific Coast Trail, but not all of it. I decided I would only do the Oregon portion, starting from the Columbia River and heading south. I determined if I started on July 1st, I could reach Ashland by August 15th. As an anticipated reward, I made reservations at the Lithia Springs Resort, where I would spend a week relaxing after my journey's end before flying back to Portland. I had a friend drop me off at the Cascade Locks access to the trail, and off I went. There were fewer people on the trail than I thought there would be, and I have to admit, it's rather frightening when the sun goes down and you're all alone. Most of the people I met were hiking north, except for a few groups that I talked to in various resupplying points. By the time I reached Mathema Valley at Crater Lake on July 25th, I had traveled about 325 miles on foot and thousands emotionally. I was starting to feel stronger and more optimistic about what my future held. On the 27th, I headed toward Callahan's Lodge. I calculated I should reach it in about six or seven days as it was 104 miles away. I looked forward to spending a night there before I arrived at Lithalia Springs Resort. I had been back on the trail for three days when my nightmare started. Two guys overtook me late that afternoon. They said hello and went on their way. That night, I found a nice spot off the trail to spend the night and went about setting up camp. I had just got my tent set up when I looked up to find the same two men that passed me a few hours ago standing in my camp area watching me. Instinctively, I knew I was in trouble. Then, one of them pulled his knife out of a scabbard he had on his belt and started coming toward me. I started screaming and threw my camp shovel at him before I began running. I was overcome by panic and was running without any idea of where I was going. I tripped and fell over some large rocks and started stumbling down the steep side of a hill. When I landed, dazed and confused, I could hear some terrible noises from my camp. It sounded like someone was being torn up by bears or wolves. After the fall, I could see I had many scrapes and cuts, and some were bleeding profusely. I slowly got up, and thank goodness nothing was broken. I made my way to a stand of trees. I sat down there and realized the noises from above had stopped but I heard something coming down the hill to where I was. I hid myself in the trees as well as I could, but whoever or whatever was still headed in my direction. I looked up 
and standing there looking at me was the biggest man beast I have ever seen. It was covered with a dark brownish orange fur and had to be over seven feet tall. It had huge hands and the feet were even larger. It bent down to look at me and suddenly it picked me up, threw me over its shoulder and carried me away. By now, I was petrified and sobbing, but I knew I didn't have a chance to get away. It smelled pretty rank, like I would expect a bear to smell. The creature finally set me down. I could see we were in a cave, and I could hear running water nearby. It started looking closely at my wounds, and then it stood up and went back further into the cave. When it came back, it had the moth in its hands or paws, and it sat down and began to chew on the moth. It began to apply the chewed-up moth to my cut. When it was apparently satisfied with the job, it looked into my eyes. I was so surprised by the intelligence I saw there. It was looking at me as though it were worried about me and wasn't sure how to treat me. It lifted up one of those big, meaty hands and began to stroke my head like you would pet a dog. The creature had streaks of blood in its fur, and I wasn't sure whether that was from my wounds or whatever had taken place at my campsite. By now, I realized this was a Sasquatch, and he wasn't going to harm me. I think he was quite old, the hair around his lips and ears were white, and his hands were gnarled as if he had arthritis. At some point, I must have fallen asleep, because when I next looked around, it was daylight outside of the cave. My body was covered with branches from fir trees, and my rescuer was gone. I hobbled toward the sound of the running water and found a small stream running through one side of the cave. After quenching my thirst, I realized how cold I was and went outside the cave to look for something to burn. I was gathering twigs when my Sasquatch returned, he had some kind of pack. It looked to be made of small branches, and it was full of blackberries. I followed him back into the cave. Those blackberries were the best I have ever tasted. After we finished our meal, I piled up the twigs I had gathered along with a few leaves. When I reached into my pocket and brought out my disposable lighter and put it to the sticks and lit them, Mr. Sasquatch was terrified. He growled and ran away just as fast as he could. I hadn't stopped to think about how fire would have frightened him. While he was gone, I took the opportunity to wash off my scrape and cut in the stream and spent the rest of the day recuperating. When the Sasquatch finally came back, he had my backpack with him. My bedroll was still attached and all my supplies were still inside. That night, I got out two of the MREs I had with me and some beef jerky. Sasquatch seemed to enjoy the meal, but he turned down the beef jerky. I think perhaps Sasquatch could be a vegetarian. We sat for a while in companionable silence before the Sasquatch left again. I spent the night in my bedroll near the small fire I built and awoke early as the sky was just beginning to lighten. Sasquatch again came with berries. I'm not sure what kind they were, although they looked like large blueberries. After we ate, I knew I needed to get on my way. My cut were healing well, and I felt ready to continue. I looked at my Sasquatch, and he looked so sad. He must have known I was getting ready to leave. I think he must have been lonely and enjoyed my companionship. He again patted my head and gave a big sigh. I stood up and put my pack on, took a deep breath, and gave the Sasquatch a quick hug. We walked outside the cave, and he pointed to a trail that wound back up to the PCT. I was back up there in no time at all, and when I turned to look back toward the cave, he was still standing there watching. I waved and then started on my way. I thought about returning to my old campsite to see if I could determine what had taken place there. But I decided to leave it alone and put it out of my mind. It took me three days to get to Callahan's Lodge 
and although I wonder what happened to the two men that tried to hurt me, I didn't say anything to anyone about it. I canceled my reservation in Ashland and stayed at Callahan for a couple of days before arranging transportation to Medford so I could fly home. I've never told the story to anyone. The Sasquatch I met saved my life, and I don't want anyone to try to seek them out. I know it would only be disastrous to their kind. On to the next one. Back in the late fall of 2004, I was chopping wood near the side of my house when my dog, Ginger, arrived at my side. She looked anxious, like she was determined to show me something. I immediately knew something was up because it was the only time I'd ever seen her act that way, and she was a nine-year-old golden retriever. Of course, at the time, I assumed she was about to show me nothing more than maybe a dead raccoon or some other woodland creature. Little did I know, I was in for the shock of a lifetime. My name is Dale, and I've always been a simple guy with a simple life. I was never exposed to any kind of violent crime aside from a handful of bar fights and domestic disputes. I lived in the same small Wisconsin town my whole life and only switched houses once I acquired the money and decided I'd like to have more land. That move happened when I was 43 years young and this incident occurred about a year and a half afterward. Aside from bartending on the weekend, I've spent most of my time at home, working and hanging out with the various dogs I've had the pleasure of calling family. I'm a furniture designer and conduct almost all of my work from inside my garage. Aside from deliveries, I mention all of that because i had never seen or heard anything that I thought was unordinary until the day that Ginger guided me into the nearby woods. My property has nearly 15 acres, and my nearest neighbor is just over a mile up the road. About a third of my property is comprised of forest that spreads across the horizon in my backyard. The other portion is mostly meadow and extends to the road. I've never experienced anything other than peace and serenity on my land. For me, it's nothing short of paradise. But I must admit, I haven't fully embraced that perception ever since that frightening day. At one point, I had to start running to catch up to Ginger. She sped up once. She was about 20 yards from the woods, which must have been because of the excitement from getting close to her recent discovery. The scent of decay had to be slapping her nose by that time. After continuously calling her name while weaving my way past, which seemed like endless branches and thorn bushes, I caught sight of her. But what lay just beyond her nearly caused me to lose my balance. I had never seen anything like it, not even in the movies. I don't know how to put this lightly, but there it was, a log sticking out of the soil with a hand-carved point and an impaled human body near the top. A cloud of flies swarmed around the top of what appeared to be a heavy-set man still wearing a jacket, a pair of light blue denim jeans, and a cold weather jacket. Because he had been impaled somewhere in his lower back region, his head hung in a way that displayed wide open eyes and a gaping mouth. There he was, a look of both terror and surprise on his face, making me think that whatever had happened to him was probably very sudden. Although the man's head was rather puffy from the settlement of stagnant blood flow, I could still tell I didn't recognize him. There are many hiking trails within the vicinity of my property, so it's not at all uncommon for outsiders to venture around those parts and go for leisure strolls. The area has always seemed to attract bird watchers, likely due to the variety of hawks, falcons, owls, and even occasional bald eagle inhabiting it. What could this man have been doing to have deserved such a brutal fate? 
But perhaps the more important question was, what the heck could have done something like this? Can you even begin to imagine the strength needed to accomplish the task of getting a full-grown man up there? Ginger paced back and forth, softly whimpering while I tried to determine how to go about this. Believe it or not, I almost planned on not calling the cops because the last thing I wanted was for there to be a homicide investigation happening on my property. That notion probably speaks volumes on how much I value my solitude. Well, I discovered I had too much of a moral compass after all, and decided Ginger and I would head to the house to summon the authorities. But it quickly proved challenging to pull my eyes away from the grotesque view. The corpse had to be at least 30 feet high. How would anyone or anything have been able to carry the strange monument? Plus, I could only guess how deep the log penetrated the soil. For all I could see, that log extended another five to ten feet under the surface. It had to go deep because I'd estimate the deceased man to have weighed around 225 pounds. That would most definitely require a pole to secure the log in an upright position. And what type of tools was utilized to carve such a sharp and perfect point to a piece of the human body? I right away knew human hands and manual sharpener wouldn't be capable. The task would require machinery or immense inhuman strength. There's simply no way around that. I have enough knowledge from crafting furniture to know how that stuff works. I soon realized that the more I studied the various aspects of what lay before me, the harder it was to pull my attention away from it. I'd almost go as far as to say Something about the whole thing felt slightly witchy, and Ginger's unchanged, characteristic behavior only reinformed that. Come on, let's go home, I said to my dog, trying to sound calm and unstartled. But she wasn't the only one that seemed to react to my voice. That was when I heard what sounded like something heavy flanking the area where we stood. Although I couldn't see the culprit, it sounded like I was on the other side of the log-sized spear that penetrated the corpse. Whatever had done this, it was watching us from the shadows. As the footsteps seemed to grow closer, Ginger began whimpering, louder than ever. It appeared crystal clear to her we were no match for whatever it was. Without saying a word, I grabbed my dog's collar and gently pulled her in the direction that would take us home. I didn't want to say another word. I wanted Ginger to stop whining. As tempted as I was to run, I didn't want whatever was in those woods to know that we were terrified. I held my dog collar in a way that communicated I wanted her to keep her attention forward. She tried to look behind us a few times, but I felt it and quickly stopped her. I briefly glanced behind me when we were about halfway to the house. I didn't do a full turn because I didn't want to lock eyes with whatever followed us, but I could see enough of it out of my peripheral vision to know that it was huge and bipedal. The thing had to be at least a whole foot taller than me, was a pale brown color, and was just massive. I had this weird feeling that if I turned around, it would be kind of like looking into the eyes of the Greek mythological character Medusa. I just felt that it would have some sort of adverse effect on me, and probably my dog. As I'm sure so many dog owners can relate, I felt that my pet's life is far more important than my own, and I wanted to do everything in my power to protect that. I would have handed myself over without hesitation had I known doing so would somehow preserve Ginger's life. Once my house was finally in sight, that was when I let go of my dog's collar and told her to run for home. Just seeing my spirit was always enough to get her the same reaction out of her. She would always catch up to me and run alongside me whenever I ran. I could barely believe it when we made it inside and locked the door behind us. I was afraid the tall creature would barge its way into my house. But all was quiet. I didn't even hear a peep of anything snooping around outside. Anyhow, I called the local sheriff to tell him about what we had found, 
and warned him that the culprit was still at large. I never mentioned that what I saw was a monster because, let's be honest, I never looked directly at it. But I know something inhuman committed that violent act and followed me and my dog home. Another person from the station called me later that night and explained that they never found anything, but told me to be sure to let them know if something else comes up. I'm not sure if they were being sincere with me. I just had this feeling like they couldn't disclose anything to me if they did encounter something strange. I stayed up for the rest of the night, frequently glancing out the window, and that's when I saw the glow of light shining from somewhere deep in the wood. As curious as I was to see what was going on, the last thing I desired was to go back over there. I figured if the local government were dealing with something, I'd be able to find out about it in the following day. The following day, I gave the sheriff another call and told him all about the light, but he insisted he knew nothing. I now live my life knowing I'll never get to the bottom of what I encountered. On to the next one. Hi, my name is Caroline. I had just graduated high school when my dad decided to take me on a helicopter ride through Denali National Park. It was a place I had always wanted to see. I also always wanted to ride in a helicopter, so he used my graduation as a way to kill two birds with one stone and take me on an adventure I'd never forget. What's sad is that I wish I could forget it. It traumatized me for life. There's no question about it. After several years of therapy, I have finally decided to come out and tell the story. It marks the first time I've been willing to disclose it to anyone outside my family and friends. For years, even my closest friend would always ask me about what happened, and I didn't know what to do other than turn them down. The reality was that I couldn't speak of it without bursting into tears. So, even if I did want to discuss it, it felt nearly impossible. There is truly nothing I wouldn't do to erase the memory from my head. My dad tries to comfort me by sometimes joking about it, but I often think he has similar trauma. He just has too much pride to display that it bothers him that much. On the trip, it was just me, my dad, and the helicopter pilot, who happened to be a friend of my dad. They were in the military together way back in the day. The trip started so well, and I was ecstatic to be there. Lucky enough, we immediately saw wildlife. I can't remember if it was elk or moose that we saw, but whatever they were, there were many of them, some of which had large racks of antlers, I felt like I was in the middle of filming a very professional nature documentary for a nature network. We had been in the air for maybe 20 minutes and had just gone between two mountain peaks when we came across a scene that didn't make any sense. I remember asking the pilot a question when I noticed something had caught his attention below. He hadn't said anything, but for some reason, I could just tell he had suddenly grown very nervous. That was when my father leaned over to try to see what his friend spotted. What in the hell? He muttered. My dad has never been one to startle easily, so I right away knew that something unusual was up. However, I had no idea that I was about to become a part of his real-life horror story. I honestly don't know how else to put it than to say that we spotted an open field full of dead bodies. They were all so pale every one of them. There had to be over 30, and they were all butt naked. Some were lying on their stomachs, some on their backs, and others in fetal position. It was hard to see the rest of them, looking purely malnourished, and seemed to have been crawling like they were trying to escape. What could they have been trying to get away from? But perhaps the strangest part of all was how every one of them was bald. Bald? Why? The pilot circled the scene for a little while. He reported the sighting to the authorities. Understandably, the person on the other end of the radio had difficulty comprehending it. It didn't make sense to us either. So how would it make sense to anyone merely being told about it? There were seemingly endless miles of forest, 
surrounding this clearing, leaving it very difficult to theorize what might have happened to these bodies. As far as we could see, there had been no forest fire, so it's not like these people might have gotten trapped in one. Another bizarre aspect was how we couldn't spot any ash around the body. Call me crazy, but it was almost as if they were lying in the green grass and had been sunburnt to death. Why would all those people involve themselves in such a strange act? My dad snapped many pictures of the weird scene, but he didn't have a high-tech camera with a fancy lens. It was an average digital camera equipped with a stock lens intended for close-range photos. Eventually, we started making our way back to the landing pad, and I was already feeling sick to my stomach from having seen so many deaths. I'd never before seen a dead body, not even at a funeral. Every funeral I'd attended had displayed a closed casket. I remember it was when we were landing that my dad made some remark about how those individuals didn't even appear human to him. He's not the type of guy to believe in the paranormal or anything out of the realm of science, so it was disconcerting to hear him, of all people, say such a thing. Surprisingly, there was already a police car parked near the landing pad. Soon after greeting the officer, another two police cars showed up. I was blown away by how seriously the situation was taken already, because all they had was our word and the story had to have sounded so bizarre. One of the officers asked if he could see the photos my father took on his camera, and I didn't even get the chance to see them myself before they confiscated the camera. They told my dad he would come off as very cooperative and friendly. Soon after we wrapped up our conversation with the officers, my dad and I went to a local restaurant with his pilot friend, they seemed like they didn't want to discuss the incident anymore, but now I think it's just because they were in front of me and could tell I was very shaken up. Very little makes any sense to me about that time in my life. It was only a few weeks ago, but there was something very off about that whole period. My dad and I talked about it very little until it became clear that I needed professional help. Before that point, he probably assumed it was easiest to dismiss the topic due to its grim nature. My parents had been separated for years, so I don't think they discussed it much with each other. They weren't on the best of terms, so I guess it would have been awkward for them to have an extensive discussion, especially one involving something so awful. I highly doubt I will ever find out exactly what we saw that day, but a big part of me doesn't even want to satisfy that curiosity. As I said, I would forget the whole thing if possible. That was the first and last helicopter ride I will ever go on. On to the next one. In West Memphis, in Crittenden County in Arkansas. I'm not sure if this report is worth anything, but in the fall, me and my dad had made a hunting trip for turkey as we did every year. We got to the woods which border the Mississippi River and parked. It was about 4 a.m. We started toward the woods in pitch dark without flashlight, and as we got halfway to the woods, this god-awful scream came out of nowhere. It was as if whatever it was screamed like it was just in front of us. My dad at the time was 68 years old and had been in the woods all of his life. He had never shown fear in all of our years hunting, but at that time he was visibly scared, as was I. I wanted to turn back and go back to the truck parked under a light next to the Sun Gas Line Terminal, which was about a hundred yards back. But then, we heard the scream again. It seemed like a baby crying and a woman screaming all together at the same time. Well, I could tell my dad was scared and we made it up the edge of the wood and we sat tight till the sun came up. Then we moved down the woods for about half a mile and heard the screams three more times. It seemed like it was shadowing us 
down the bottom. Well, I saw my dad that day jump a four-wired barbed wire fence and we got to the truck and we haven't been back there since. We always used to hunt turkey and run our beagles back there. Can't say for sure what it was as we never saw any sign or tracks, but my dad stated in all of his years in the woods, he has never heard such a sound. It screamed at us till the last one was heard about 6.30 and we got out and went to the riverbank to walk back to the truck. We had heard rumors as a kid of some weird sighting about five miles down from this location. It was pitch dark, about 4 a.m. in the morning, and chilly and calm wind. A perfect hunting day in the woods and the swamp of the river bottom. On to the next one. I had been working in Arkadelphia, Arkansas. That particular day, we had to paint some boundary lines around an area near Bern, just southwest of Gurdon. It was in the afternoon, and I had already finished brushing out the line for the others to paint the dots on the trees. I knew of an old man who lived in a little shack not far from here. He always had an old logger's helmet on, carried an old filled twenty-two and only wore blue overalls and a white shirt. After I had finished, I made my way back to the truck, which was on the road that was near the railroad tracks. These tracks went through the middle of the burn. As you pull into burn from Highway 67, you cross these tracks and then turn right for approximately two miles. The road then tees and you can go right to cross the tracks again. Back then, the road went about another quarter of the mile before turning back to the right, back to 67. Our truck was parked on that last turn that goes back to Highway 67. I had made my way onto the tracks to wait for the others. I wasn't quite a quarter of a mile from where the road crossed over the tracks. The signs that let you know of the tracks are maybe eight feet high. When I noticed something on the tracks at the crossover. I noticed that it appeared to be another foot taller. That could have been an optical illusion at that distance. I noticed that I could not see the silver hard hat that the old man always wore or the white shirt or the gun. This thing, whatever it was, might have been stopped on the tracks and turned. When it turned, it had to turn the whole upper torso as though it had a stiff neck. It was mostly dark in color, though it did have some lighter spots on it. It appeared to take a step towards me when another logging company's truck gunned its motor and startled this creature. It seemed to notice this turn and take two steps to get into the woods. If you have ever been down the track of the railroad, you know that it would be impossible for a normal man to make that kind of distance in only two steps. You have to take into consideration that I was only 18 at the time and still had a pretty vivid imagination. Even with the evidence, I still, at that time, I questioned what I might have really seen. It wasn't until later that I found out that there have been many sightings of some creature in that part of the woods. A buddy of mine told me that his grandmother lived in that area and had trouble from a two-legged creature getting into her garbage at night. He said that there was only one time that the creature came up on her back porch and looked into her window. She said it looked somewhat like a monkey. She never admitted that she was scared because it never threatened her in any way. This story sort of validated mine. This is not the only time that I have seen a creature out in the woods. This occurrence happened at about 20 to 30 miles away from this. The only other thing that I heard was some type of growling, like a wail, and barking that I have never heard before. There was also some vocalizations made that did not appear to have been made by a human. If you can imagine the gobble made by a shack tube, then that is the closest thing that I can imagine. I know that there are many people out there that have been in the woods more than me. 
but I know the sound of almost all the indigenous animals in Arkansas. This was something that at the time I had never heard. This area is pretty much a low, flat area with standing water. On the road to this area, there is a pipeline and that travels to a river. It has all types of trees, including hardwood, pulpwood, and others that are considered worthless. On to the next one. In Crawford County in Arkansas, my parents had just bought a home. We had been in the home for about a year now at this point, and I had now a very good knowledge of all the forest area around us. And as a 15-year-old boy, I loved going out into the woods, finding deer antlers, and going on hikes up to the old forestry observance tower. This particular Friday, I had planned to take my pup tent and a little food with me and go camping like I had done several times before. I started my hike with my best friend, Chris, who was staying over for the weekend to go camping with me. We left the house right after he arrived, around 5 p.m., and we got to where we were going to camp out at around 7 p.m., high up on the mountain, which is a long, hard, and treacherous hike by any means. We set up our tent and made a nice fire and started to cook hot dogs when I needed to go to the bathroom. So I went off into the woods to do nature's business. Shortly after digging a hole, I heard something being thrown through the branches. This happened about four or five times and I thought it was Chris clowning around and I yelled at him to stop throwing stuff at me. I then heard him yell that if I throw something again, he was going to throw something at me. It didn't make sense. I wasn't throwing anything at him. I was pulling my pants back up when I was hit with a stick about an inch in diameter and about a foot long that was freshly twisted off a tree. I got back and had the stick that hit me in my hand because I was going to hit Chris with it since he hit me, but he was in the tent. I asked him to come out and he said he wasn't. That he was mad at me for throwing stuff at him that he got into the tent so he wouldn't get hit. About that time, we heard low, long grunting burping sound that started out quiet and got louder towards the end of each grunt. I didn't know what it was, but it was getting louder and louder each time. It would make the noise three or four times and stop and then the sound of something being beaten on with what reminded me of hitting a baseball bat against a tree, but really hard. And then we heard thud sounds like it was being hit on the ground, and then the grunting would start again. By this time, me and Chris were scared. I had a twenty-two rifle with me that my dad had made me always take camping. If it were just us kids in case of coyotes, I got the twenty-two out of the tent and Chris got the light and shined it into the wood. And about twenty-five yards away from us, we saw a very tall man standing there beside a tree. As soon as the light hit his area, he ducked behind the tree, but we noticed with the light he was huge. Around seven feet tall, at least, and was wearing what reminded me of a ghillie suit that a hunter wears, all covered with reddish-brown fur and the smell that was coming from it was awful. It reminded me of roadkill and a wet dog combined together. I didn't even dare use the rifle because I knew that if you shot anything large with a twenty two, you're just not going to do much to it because even a deer won't drop with a twenty two. and this person or thing was a lot bigger than a deer or a bear which are in the area. Me and Chris backed up slowly and poured water on the fire. We were still hearing the grunt, but not the same sounding grunt. These were now more of a growling oo sound. We finally turned and using the light to keep us from breaking our necks, ran as fast as we could. I haven't been hiking or camping since. Don't ever plan to go again and will not live near any forest areas, much less live in them. We moved to Cedarville two years later and haven't been back since 
and won't be for as long as I live. Me and Chris don't even talk about that night. We both had nightmares for a long time about that night. I know what I heard, smelled, and saw and never want to see it again. Now I live in Las Vegas, Nevada, and I'm fine without the forest and trees. You will never get me in them again because I know what's in them. On to the next one. In Jackson County in Arkansas, my sighting happened in the summer. I was 12 years old at the time. I was at my grandmother's house outside of Bradford, Arkansas. My grandparents owned a large farm where the White County Line and the Jackson County Line met. It was around 9 to 9.30 a.m. I had slept in the guest room that night. When I woke up, I had the feeling as if someone was watching me. There was a window next to the bed, and as I looked to see if someone was there, I noticed a Bigfoot staring at me through the top pane. I'm six foot five, and I can only see through the bottom of the window. That may give you an idea of the Bigfoot height. It was reddish brown. I just looked and stared for probably 30 to 45 seconds. I never felt threatened or scared at any time. After this time had passed, I wanted to see more. So I tried to step out of the bed really softly, and when I did, the rug that was on the hardwood floor slipped and I lost my footing. As I was down on my knee, the Bigfoot stared at me. I was very puzzled. I was at a point where I just had to see what was going on. I then turned and tried to run to the back of the house where I could see the Bigfoot. When I got to the back door, I saw it running through a field and toward an old barn. It had a very distinct running style. Its hands were straight down and flat. I tried to get my grandmother and mom's attention, but they didn't get there in time. The Bigfoot was very slim, had a muscular build. It all happened on an early summer morning. Very bright and sunny and hot outside. There were woods on the back of the property, as well as a few open pastures and hills to the west. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!